So in today's episode, we are going to talk to Brenda Condon's son, Todd. Um, more victimology. Now, victimology is not, you know, sexy. People would rather it be suspects or something of that effect, but it's not reality, okay? This is reality-based. You have to meticulously go through each part of the investigation to successfully conclude hopefully at the end what happened to the person and in this case uh, Brenda Condon now I spent a good two hours with Todd very very nice gentleman um, who my heart goes out to I mean can you imagine that I mean he's going to talk to you about waiting outside with his sister for his mom to show up to pick them up and her never shown. I mean, it's just uh, a lot of times when crimes are committed like this, if there was a crime committed, again, I tend to believe that there was and she didn't run away. And obviously you're going to get Todd's take on that as well. But they don't think about the ripple effects that happen when they take away somebody's mom, sister. You know, most of these people are sociopaths. I won't go as far as saying psychopaths. Sociopaths, meaning they have no remorse for what they do. Now, every now and again, you'll get people that killed and didn't necessarily mean to and they felt remorse. I'm hoping that that's the case here. Well, honestly, I kind of hope she's alive somewhere. That, as hard as that is uh, for some people to believe, and it's hard for me to believe, I would prefer that than to find her deceased. But again, the family certainly would like to find her one way or another, and so would I, and that's why I'm here. So this is my interview with Brenda Condon's uh, son, Todd, and I'm not going to show the whole two-and-a-half-hour, you know, talk that we did because um, – I, I don't think that you need to see it. Maybe at some point in time I'll release the whole thing, but I'm going to show you snippets of this. Because what I want you to take from this is the impact that unsolved murders have on victims' family members. You can see the pain. In his eyes, he tries to mask it. He's a man, but I, I've talked to many family members that have gone through this, and I can see it. Um, and it's it's heartbreaking. You know, it's easy for me to sit here and say, ah, you know, it, nothing bothers me. You know, I've seen it all. I've been, but that's not the reality. The reality is, I care for these victims' families. Or to be honest with you, I probably wouldn't be doing this. I do it for them. You get a greater purpose in life. You know, some of us find it, some of us don't. This is mine. I have no hobbies in life. I want hobbies. You know, man, I wish I could go out in the golf course. I'm retired. I was able to retire at 44 years old to do this. Okay? To do television on the History Channel, Reels Channel, ID Channel, whatever it is. And have this platform on YouTube. Um, and to investigate cold cases when families hire me. Now, the Condon family did not hire me. I'm doing this pro bono, which I don't do often. But uh, I feel it necessary in this case. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm blessed to be able to do something that I love for a living. This is my hobby. This is my life. It's in my DNA. This is what I do. So, this is Todd Condon. 
He's going to drop some knowledge on us, some things that you may have known about his mom, some things that you may not have known about his mom. But it's all important for us, me and you, to understand who Brenda Condon was and what her disappearance has done to her family. Watch and listen. Okay, so first of all, your name is? Todd Condon. Okay, and what's your relationship to Brenda? Uh, Brenda was my mother. Okay, and you ma'am? My name's Pam Condon, and Brenda was my sister-in-law. Okay, and you knew uh, Brenda fairly well yourself? Oh, yes, we spent a lot of time together shopping all the time. Shoe shopping we love to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, and she, we just kind of hung out a lot, you know. Uh, she was like a sister. I didn't have any sisters, and uh, so we were pretty close. Okay. Uh, um, and this happened on February 26th, I believe, 1991. And yeah, Todd, 26th you were... into the 27th. I would have been 12 at 12. the time. Yes. Okay. Almost 13. Um, tell me a little bit, from your perspective, Todd, of uh, what you remember from your mom. Meaning, responsible, good mom, was there, not there. Uh, my mother was, was awesome. Um, she was a fun mom, uh, you know, she, she, like, she would take us to amusement parks and just, she liked to have fun. She liked to do things and, and be involved with us. Um, she was very punctual and conscientious as far as, you know, like, if she said, I'll be there at seven, she was there at seven or slightly before. Okay. So it wasn't, you know... It wasn't like she said, oh, yeah, I'll be here at 7, and at 9 o'clock she showed up. Right. You know, um, in fact, the morning that they told us, which, you know, as you had mentioned, wasn't until, what, March 2nd when they actually initiated the investigation because they, she hadn't shown up uh, to, to pick us up that morning for her visitation. My sister and I were both standing out in the driveway waiting for her, you know, and we're like, why is she not here? Why is she not here? Why is she not here? Because that was not like her at all. You know, if she said seven, it was seven, or slightly beforehand. I mean, you know, she was very punctual and conscientious about her time with us, as well as customers and, you know, uh, much like I try to be to this day, and I think a lot of that... I, some of it came from my dad too. Don't get me wrong. You know, he taught us a valuable work ethic and to be on time. And but my mother was that way too. Was she uh, outgoing? Oh, she was very outgoing. She could talk okay. to that wall and get a response. <laughs> you know, she was just a friendly, charismatic, um, outgoing. Okay. You know, she 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 could talk to anybody or you know strike up a conversation. And it didn't have to be about anything in general. Just, hey, how are you today? Kind of thing, you know. Sure. Uh, she was very outgoing. Okay. Um, and, you know, identified with a lot of different people. And, and you know, she wasn't... How about um, fright? Like, did things scare her? Like, if... Would no. she be... Could she stay alone in a house oh, yeah. and be fine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Mom would. Uh, <coughs> Mom was a feisty little thing for 110 she pounds. Does. Okay, well, <laughs> explain that to me. Well, she she just didn't have that fear of you know, I guess from the outgoing nature and stuff, you know, and maybe uh, you know I don't know what she saw as as a a kid. I do know um, her mother passed away when she was very young. Mm -hmm. You know, so she didn't have that motherly connection. You know, she, we grew up in a rural area. You just had to kind of learn to survive on your own and do things for yourself and, you know, uh, be independent. You didn't need anybody's help. You know, if it was there, fine. But if not, I'll do it myself. You know, that's just kind of how she lived. I mean, and she wasn't afraid to whoop your ass either. <laughs> you know, as a kid, you were getting it twice. You were getting ass whooping once from mom and then once again from dad when he got home. So, right. you know, she, she outgoing and things, but take no shit. You know, she wasn't somebody to just let somebody walk all over her either. So, um, no, as far as staying in the house, she, that wouldn't have bothered her a bit. Okay. You know, and a lot of her cleaning stuff in Williamsport was in the evening. Because she had banks and 
things like that, which we had gone to some of those, you know, and kind of helped even a little bit. Just, hey, are you vacuum this carpet? You know, I'm over here wiping, dusting this desk, you know, type of thing. Um, so you would go with her on some of those We things? would occasionally go with her, yes, yeah. in the evenings because we obviously were in school during the day when she was doing the resident houses and, th you know, things like that, where at night the commercial properties had to be taken care of because obviously they were in business during the day, so that required her to clean at night. Williamsport, not really a major crime-ridden area, but still some, uh, much like any more heavily populated area. Right. You know, uh, even State College, it, it has its dangers, you know. Um, any little city, I guess, is, you know, what you would refer to Williamsport as, a little city. It's so, not super huge. So when you were down in Williamsport with her, that... So where did you guys live before that as a family? We had actually lived in Croft okay. uh, at my dad's home, yep. um, you know, where I grew up and where we had gone back to, you know, like I said, to be with our friends. Okay. Um, we grew up there. And then and that's then, when your mom moved? <clears throat> she, I'm not sure how, got started into the business. I don't know if it was at the fair or, you know, I'm not quite sure how the business got started or, or so on. Um, but I know she, you know, dove into it wholeheartedly and, uh, you know, worked on picking up clientele. Uh, excuse me, she did have some assistance from the, the owner, which was a boiler place. Actually, they, they had owned a couple businesses. This was kind of like a secondary business that was kind of operated out of, because I remember seeing the, the boss so to speak, you know, the franchisee, um, or the franchiser, I guess. Um, I remember going to see him a couple times, too, because they had vans and stuff there, you know. So it was like a secondary business operated out of this boiler manufacturing facility in Williamsport. Um, and that's the reason she moved down there, to be closer yes, to that? Yes, that was... I think she was the first, or one of the first franchisees for that gotcha. particular cleaning business. Okay. Um, obviously just starting and being out of Williamsport there were clients there. Okay. The first apartment we moved to down there was in Hughesville, just outside of Williamsport. Yep. Um, we lived at that apartment for well, a few months. I And I can't tell you dates because I Obviously, I was 12 years old. That was 30-plus years ago. Sure. Um, we moved to an apartment right in Williamsport then a few months afterwards. And Loyal Sock? Yes, I did go to Loyal Sock okay. schools. Both me and my sister went to Loyal Sock. Okay. Um, like I said, I can't tell you the That's dates okay. when we moved or whatever, but the first apartment was in Hughesville. Yep. <laughs> um, and then the second apartment was in town, second floor, in Williamsport. Okay. Um, and you're there for how long? You really didn't live there, right? Because you... Well, no, we did actually well, stay did. with her for a little while, because I told you previous, Dad was in Texas doing some work okay. with a friend of his. Um, they had plenty of carpentry work and stuff down there going on at the time, so... And his friend... I uh, knew the area and resided there, so Dad actually went down. I remember him sending me a picture at Christmas of what had to have been 90, wearing a pair of shorts. I think they were down around Corpus Christi at the time. So, you know, just, hey, look at me at Christmas Day. Right. <laughs> you know, here I am wearing a pair of shorts, and, of course, it's freezing up here, you know. Right. Um, so it would have had to have been, I think we finished out that school year, if memory serves me correctly. I think we finished out that school year and then decided that we wanted to come back and be with our friends. And and then he had moved back. Obviously. Yeah, he had moved back um, beforehand. And okay. then that's kind of when we decided, you know, look, we want to be near our friends and people that we know. And Okay. All right. I want to stop this right here because what he's saying is very important. The reason Brenda did not have custody of the kids had nothing to do with her lifestyle or her parenting skills. The kids 
who were 10 and 12 at the time, they decided they wanted to be with their family, um, with their friends, and not go to a new school. That's very important. What? then you would visit her down there at that apartment still or did she move again? at that point in time she was getting ready to move to state college with okay. greg okay and she's she seeing greg while she was living in that apartment in loyal sock that's all right if you don't remember she must have been if she's moving up here with. I yeah, I, I would have to say yes. I can't. I don't remember. Okay. You know because at, at that point in time in Williamsport we still hadn't met him yet. Okay. So it would have had to have been relative, relatively fresh if that was the case. Okay. You know, like maybe they had just met, and I don't know. I know she had some clients in State College as well. So I don't know if that's something that she had picked up and that's how she met him or, okay. you know, I'm not sure how all that transpired either. But then at some point now she moves from Loyal Sock to State Here, College. Yeah, well, and she would, would have been from the apartment in Williamsport okay. because that was second. The, the apartment in Hughesville was first. Okay. And then we moved to downtown Williamsport <clears throat> and I don't remember the address or... You know, the only thing I can remember is the neighbors getting mad at me for in mid-afternoon cranking up Yellow Submarine. <laughs> uh, I do remember that, but because um, the neighbors downstairs were a younger couple and yeah. were you know working and stuff like that, which I like my music and me I too. listen to it pretty loud most of the time. So hey, if I'm listening well, to the neighbors, <clears throat> when she moves back up here, does she move immediately in with Greg? Or does she get a place on her own? No, she moved in with Greg. Right, and yeah, Greg. there was no okay. apartment or anything that I'm aware of in okay. between there. She moved in with Greg, um, and then it was like, hey, I'm starting at this bar. Okay, what I'm trying to establish here is how she met Greg. Greg is no longer alive. I can't speak to him. And what was the relationship like? Did he visit her down in Williamsport? Did she move in with him up here? And how did she start working at this mysterious Carlsbad's Tavern Bar? Was it through Greg? Was it through Carl? Let's see what Todd has to say about it. Which, you know, she had told us about whatever. Now, I wasn't aware of the slippage of clientele and, you know, where she wasn't showing up to those jobs. Or that was something that you had indicated that, you know, I was not aware of because she was not a person to, you know, say, hey, I'm not, not coming or, you know, yeah, I'll be there. At, uh, that just wasn't her. Now, if it if I'm supposed to be here today, I'll be here today, you know, right. and that's the way she, she worked. It was... All right, what Todd's talking about in the slippage of clientele is I have information that she started no-showing. Now, this is important because I know that could happen because of jealousy, domestic violence. There's a multitude of reasons, but also drug use. And when somebody that's punctual all the time and you can rely on them starts no-showing, starts being late, it's a red flag. It's an indicator that something is going wrong in that person's life. It's something is changing. And I want to get to the bottom of it. Why? So that's why Todd's referring to that. And that's why I asked him the question. Let's get it out in the open. What could it be? Her jobs and those things, you know, that was her livelihood, her income. She made sure those things were taken care of. So, you know, like I said, that was something that I wasn't aware of. And I actually, I went back through and listened to your podcast and stuff, too, because I actually have a couple questions of my own, too, and some things that, you know, obviously both of us are, are kind of curious about. Um, <laughs> but again, I wasn't aware of, of that slippage of, of clientele, you know, and not showing up to the, the jobs and stuff like that. That's just doesn't seem like her no it does not seem like her at all okay because i know from williamsport with us going on the jobs in the evening you know we could do our homework and like i said we always helped out a little bit maybe sweep the 
carpet or something like that, you know, and she would come in and inspect it. So we just kind of, we were there with her, you know, she could get her work done and we were still able to spend time together and, you know, like I said, we helped out a little bit. So when she moves in with Greg, you obviously, she, you go there, we had the visits and stuff, yes. right? Um, what was the, what was your feeling about the household? Um, good vibe, Greg, when you see them interact, treats are good, he treats you guys good, Yeah, everything like yep. that? Um, Greg was always, obviously he was a car enthusiast, he had two Corvettes, and you know, me as a young boy, what well, that's cars, you know, I, I love cars, and those kinds of things so I uh, and you know as I've mentioned to you I went to the gas station periodically just to kind of help out and you know get to, to see people and, and do a little bit I actually worked in Fuel Island here and there pumping gas yeah. you know just because it was something for me to do and I enjoyed doing it he was good to her he was good to us uh, a lot of times Saturday mornings I used to sit and watch like Motor Trend TV you know He'd always go, oh, check out that car type of thing. So he interacted with us very well. Um, and now, would you go there, do you think, during the week? Or was it more of a weekend type thing? It was more weekend type things. Okay. Um, obviously, she worked during the week. So it kind of became more weekend. You know, if she came to see us through the week, it was we stayed there and, you know, would maybe go to a, a dinner or, um, you know, if the fair was going on, she might take us into the, the county fair or something like that but through the week we stayed there because we had school so we'd have to get up in the morning and be you know be to school right uh weekends we stayed over there okay uh, both my sister and i what was the what was the lifestyle on the weekend when you were there uh did they get up early did they get up together did they have late nights would they leave you there by yourselves and no go uh, no they never left us there by ourselves okay uh, mom would never you know, at that age, I mean, she was cool with us being alone for 10 or 15 minutes or something. At nights, she was, was with us. Okay. You know, I never, and I a lot of times stayed up, obviously a night out, you know. Um. Now you're asking yourself, why did I ask that question? Again, it's going back to lifestyle. Greg's a drug dealer. Greg's a user. If Brenda's a user too. I want to know how deep they are into it because there's people that will do drugs and leave their kids by themselves. They put themselves ahead of everything else and they go out and they party. Uh, that has a different risk factor than somebody that doesn't. And so that is important. And I'm trying to determine what was Greg and Brenda's lifestyle together. Were they bar flies? Did they drink at home in front of the kids? Uh, did they do coke in front of the kids? I'm betting there is a party atmosphere there when the kids aren't there. But I don't know that, and that's why I'm asking. So let's see what else Todd has to say here. I work night shift, graveyard shift, boot camp. Like I'm a night owl, so I'm up a lot of late hours and things of that nature and not so much getting up in the mornings and you know but when they did get up they get up together they usually make breakfast for us it was just kind of a lazy you know chill and maybe go to a show or you normal? know yeah just a normal that... like any family would do pretty much okay uh, obviously we were a little apprehensive of them just because normally as kids you know somebody knew you're Right. Yeah, the one, you know, right. you kind of try and figure them out. And, okay, is this some person, somebody that I would, you know, feel comfortable with? And you have to work on that. That takes time. Um, but but it was always... Always good. Good to us. And, you know, um, like I said, he invited me over to the gas station to just kind of help out and, you know, do things that I enjoy doing. I like being in the garage. I like being, you know, out pumping gas and just doing those things. So he, he did try and, and bring us in as, you know, part of the, make to make us feel comfortable, I guess. You know, and I never saw anything in there particularly that would be a cause for concern or nothing at that age really that I would have noticed as a concern. Right. 
Now, I did one time. I don't know. I don't even remember all the parameters or anything like that. But I do remember there being a tray underneath the couch that I was watching TV on. And I don't know what was in it or whatever. But I remember there was a little grumbling because I pulled that tray out. Now do you see why I was asking those questions? Exactly as I thought. There's drug use there. Okay. And it's trying to be hid from the kids, which is a good thing. Uh, I hasn't reached that level yet where you are doing it in front of the kids. But it's important to know that drug use was taking place at that time when Brenda disappeared. And that's why I had to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. Knowing what I know now, it was probably paraphernalia related. Sure. Um, Pam, what was your thought? Did you ever see uh, any drug usage? Okay, so I want to stick with the drug usage. And again, I'm going to ask Pam, the sister-in-law, who's hung out with Brenda. I need to know from a different perspective. Not her 13-year-old kid at the time. He's not going to know all the particulars. But a friend is. Somebody that's hanging out with her, her same age, they're going to know more. So that's why I directed the question over to Pam now to get her perspective on the drug use of Brenda Condon and Greg. No, because at that time, I had moved to Atlantic City and was there eight years. I missed a good portion of, and I was just coming back to Pennsylvania when she disappeared. Uh, in fact, when the first report came in, uh, Tom, had, my brother, had been helping me move into another apartment. So, but I hadn't had a chance really to see her at that time. So it had been quite a while since I had seen her at that time. Okay. Because, as I say, I lived in But Jersey. before that? All right, I'm not letting Aunt Pam go that easy. We're going to go back to this drug question because... She's trying to protect Brenda. She doesn't want to say anything, and I get it. I've seen it thousands of times in interviews. You don't never want to say anything disparaging about a murder victim or somebody that's missing. I get it. But I know there's more there, and I want, I want the truth. And so I'm not letting Pam off the hook yet. We are going to keep diving into this drug question. Was there any, did you know of any drug usage? Um, I mean, because... She and I would smoke some pot. Okay. But as much as... <laughs> that was pretty consistent at that yeah. point in time. Yeah. As, yeah. But other than that, no. Okay. Not at that time. Because one of the things that I hate doing, and I know m people of missing persons are always protective of them, and sometimes they don't want to, like speak bad about them and i get that but sometimes that's needed in order to get to the that's truth like, yeah um and that's why i ask it okay. uh you know we all know now obviously that greg dealt drugs i mean obviously he was arrested for it, and it was no small amount i no. mean he was putting out a, month is, a lot yeah especially in that point in time you know 50 in 1990 one early 2000s fifty thousand dollars a month is probably what hundred thousand dollars a month now right. it, it pretty much doubled in price so yeah that that those are copious amounts of illegal narcotics right to be dealing with now do you think that it's possible that she ended up being with greg because of drugs i mean she if she didn't know that he maybe he wasn't a drug dealer then maybe he was just a drug user um I mean, at some point in time, she had to have realized who he is. Well, and I think maybe that was, as she had mentioned earlier, um, my, she had gone over to my dad's the day, before, the day of, which I'm sure is why they looked at him so hard, because obviously he was one of the last people to see her alive. But he said she had made a comment to him to not trust anybody, which was unusual for her, but he didn't really, you know, he thought, okay, maybe she's just having a bad day, and, you know, somebody maybe ripped her off and didn't pay her for 
cleaning services or, you know, so he didn't really think to, she just, and that was all she said. Don't trust anybody. Pretty cryptic. Yeah. You know, I mean, and looking back now on it, even he's like, yeah, that was odd. But he said, you know, he said, I just thought maybe somebody ripped sure. her off for a cleaning service, didn't pay her, or she was going to have to go to court over, you know, somebody not paying her or something like that. He said, I really didn't think too much of it. He said, and then they called and said, hey, look, you know, there's an issue here. We can't find her. And when was that? I think they told him as soon as she was reported missing, okay? I would assume that the police at that point in time, which would have been Spring Township Police, uh, in fact, Ron Shaw, uh, who lives just out the road here, um, and I worked with his son, John Shaw, who's now a state trooper, uh, <coughs> when I worked for Forestry, <laughs> I would assume that they would have called him right away and said, hey, have you seen Brenda? You know, we're getting a report that, you know, we weren't told until they actually started investigating, which was the second, I believe you said. We weren't actually told until that day because she hadn't shown up to get us. Do you mean you as the children or as your dad as well? Well, I don't know with that. I honestly don't okay. know when he officially knew that something was amiss. I think he knew that night. I think, okay. uh, because I think they may have called. Well, today they were hunting for him because he was helping me. Well, and I don't, you know, I don't remember that all that day. stuff either. All I know is that we, as the children, weren't told until she didn't actually come pick us up. And that was Saturday. And that was Saturday. And he had made the comment, "We didn't want to tell you until we knew for a fact that there was something amiss." Right. Obviously, she just decided she was going to go for a, you know, to get away for a day or something. Right. You know, he, so that's why they didn't tell us. I'm assuming he knew the night that Greg reported her missing because I would assume they would call him and said, hey, you know, have you seen Brenda? Which at that point in time, he had seen her the day before because she made the comment of don't trust anybody. Right. You know, which he went through numerous polygraphs and, I mean, and they, they like hammered him pretty hard. That she was borrowing. Yeah, yeah, which I believe was from Aunt Joanne, who's gone now um so, so is uncle steve but you know but those, usually those were two go-to's if she needed a little bit of money was aunt joanne or, or aunt iris and she got a check from her right i believe so yes so I, I know you had said about there was supposedly money from a check that she okay. cashed it would either had to have been aunt joanne or aunt iris and if it wasn't aunt iris it would have been aunt joanne because okay. those were the two that you know they were her side of the family Okay, the reason that I'm asking him about this check that she supposedly got uh, is because obviously money can be a factor in anything. I've seen people kill it over $10. So the amount of money, what it was for, is very important to the investigation. Now, I've come to learn, I believe, that that uh, check was never cashed. Um, so more than likely, and again, I don't know 100%, and I'm speculating a little bit here, and I hope to figure it out, obviously, at the conclusion of this investigation, that that check was in her purse, and she never had a chance to get it cashed. Or, if she did get it cashed, that money could still be in her purse, which is missing. Aunt Joanne and Uncle Steve had some money uh you know they had a trucking company and a limo business and so they had a few dollars to their name okay um iris did as well but that was because of her husband she didn't really have much as far as money went but her husband did yeah um he worked i believe for the power plant in shawville the, and iris's husband i believe he worked at the power plant in shawville so he was not rich, but he obviously had one of the better paying jobs for the area. So, you know. Um. And these people, you know, who say that she may have met somebody there at that bar that night and just decided to go start a new life. What do you got to say about the people that say that? 